Let me put it up higher. That way you can hear me. Romans chapter 3, verse number 25. Let's all stand in honor of the Word of God. Romans chapter 3, verse number 25. And I had uh, prepared this to preach last week, and uh, the Lord moved it, so here we go. You get it, amen, and uh, I'm excited. Romans chapter 3, verse number 25. We're going to read this uh, together out loud, just this one verse. Romans chapter 3, verse number 25. Ready? Begin. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you. Thank you, God, again for this, for this place. Lord, how I love to be home, how I love to come and serve and be at this church, Lord, and get to see the faces and, and be encouraged by those that are here this morning, Lord, and see the smiles and, and, and get to see, Lord, everybody again. Lord, you put my heart here in this place, and Lord, I love to be back home. Thank you, Lord, for family, and thank you, Lord, for time that I got to have this last week. But now, Lord, I pray that you'd bless as we meet with you again and we come to hear from you, Father. Would you please use me today? Holy Spirit, I'm sorry for where I failed you even probably today. Holy Spirit of God, would you please just use me and fill me in spite of my failures and just ask that you would use this poor earthen vessel just to do a work that only you can do, God. And I just ask and beg for your help this morning. Please, God, meet with us in a special and a mighty way. God, I can't do it without you. I've got to have your help. Holy Spirit, may you speak to the hearts of everybody here. May we open our hearts to receive a truth from the Word of God. May we, do, may we learn from your Word, and may we be better Christians because of it, God. Thank you, Lord, so much for all that you've done. Lord, we deserve to be in hell, but thank you for giving us a home in heaven that we can enjoy one day through faith in Christ. We love you and thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I like to preach you a message this morning that I, like I said, I prepared last week. Talk that, that if you want to give it a title, you can call it "What the Blood Can Do for You." What the blood can do for you. I was preparing, uh, thinking, and praying last week, and uh, as I thought that the Lord would use this uh, last week, but God moved it. But in my in my heart was burdened because in a, in the in America's churches we've lost the importance of the blood of Christ. Boy, we have lost the importance of the blood of Christ. And even Christians don't even realize how important the blood of Christ really was. There is so much Bible study that goes into the blood and so much that we won't even be able to cover. That God needed the blood. Look there in that statement, Romans 3.25, it says, "...whom God has set forth to be a propitiation." Talking about Jesus, God set forth His Son to be our propitiation, to take our place, to, to be the one to pay for sin. And how can we get that propitiation? How can we uh, be redeemed as in verse 24? Look there, it says, "...through faith in His blood." Boy, it takes the blood of Christ. Amen. And, and, and it's so important to understand that the, not to let people... There was a man uh, not, uh, before I was born, but he tried to say that the blood of Christ really didn't matter, that it just dissipated at the foot of the cross. But my friend, the Bible says that when Jesus shed His blood, that He took that blood to heaven and He sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And that blood forever cries, Forgiven. Boy, the blood of Christ is so important, amen. It's so important to understand that Jesus' blood is, 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 it was necessary for salvation. Let me uh, skip down here. I've even heard the claim that by some, when I've been out soul winning, that tell me that the blood of Christ is not necessary for salvation. And all of these claims are unlearned and unbiblical. The blood of Christ is a big deal. And it was not the cross itself that saves us. We have a cross that we uh, put up as an emblem to remind us, but that piece of wood is not our salvation. It was the blood of Christ. Our faith does not go to a piece of wood that stood on a hill 2,000 years ago. Our faith goes into the blood that Jesus shed. Amen. We have to get that importance. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So you understand that it's not just because it's blood. It wasn't just because that God just needed anybody's blood. Because, see, if you tried to pay for your sin with your blood, it wouldn't work. If you tried to use, like the Old Testament, the Bible says it was not possible that all the bulls and the goats that they killed 
could take away their sin. All it did was push forward till the day that Jesus could become that sacrifice. The blood that, those, that the bulls and goats that they shed never took away the sins of the children of Israel. It merely reminded them of the faith that they had put in the coming Savior. That's how that they were saved. They were saved like you and I. They had to put their faith and trust in Jesus to come. We put our faith and trust in Jesus that has come. Amen. And, but they, so it wasn't just because it was blood. It's because it was Jesus' blood that made it special. See, that's the difference. It wasn't just somebody's blood. It was the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. That's why Jesus had to die. Jesus had to shed His blood, because without the shedding of the blood of Christ, there would, no, there would be no remission of sins. There would be no forgiveness. There would be no mercy. It was Jesus that had to shed His blood. That's what made it special. Amen. Your works are not able to pay for your sin this morning. Your church attendance cannot pay for your sin. Your baptism of water cannot pay for your sin. Your repentance from all your sin cannot pay for your sin. Amen. It is all of these other doctrines that have come out. It, it, it's all unbiblical, all unlearned because it takes the blood that Jesus shed. Now, a couple things about the blood before we get into the message. Number one, what makes the blood important? This is kind of an intro to give you a, a description about the blood. Matthew 26, 28. It's Jesus' blood. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Give you a little bit of a, a Bible study here. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. The Bible says here, for this, Jesus is speaking, he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Boy, what a blessing. Amen. So the first description that we have about the blood of Christ, why it can take away sins, is because Jesus said it's my blood. Amen. When we take the Lord's communion as a church, we come and we uh, take the grape juice. It is a symbol of the blood, but Jesus is giving it to the disciples here, and He says, this is my blood of the New Testament. See, that's what makes the difference. Amen. When you got saved, you had to trust Jesus. Amen. Didn't take Buddha, didn't take the Pope, didn't take all these other things that are out there. It was by the one and only Jesus. Amen. The Savior of the world. He said it's my blood of the New Testament. See, nothing else could make a covenant for you with God. Nothing else could make a covenant with you, with God, and bring peace without the blood that Jesus shed. So it's important. Why? Because it's Jesus' blood. Why is it important for your children? Because it's Jesus' blood. Why is it important for your friends and for your family? Why? Because it was Jesus' blood. Never lose that importance. That's why all these other religions are trying to tell you that Jesus was merely a man or Jesus uh, was the brother of the devil is what some will try to tell you. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to tear down the deity of Christ because if Jesus became just a man like you and I, then His blood means nothing. But Jesus was the perfect Son of God. It was His blood. Oh, I love that. Jesus' blood. Amen. I didn't get saved. I didn't get washed in anybody's blood. Amen. I got washed in the blood of an almighty God. Boy, that's a good thought. Here's another good thought for you. How dare we then? Jesus shed His blood. The perfect Son of God shed His blood then how dare churches try to add to salvation and say, well, His blood wasn't quite good enough. You're going to have to do some more. Boy, to me, that's pretty abstinent. That's pretty prideful, isn't it? To say that Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, God Himself, His blood wasn't good enough. You're going to have to work, your, you're going to have to get baptized. You're going to have to join the church. You're going to have to do a list of good things and hope that God, how dare we? But you know why? Because it's through faith. It's through faith. We don't want to trust God. We want to trust ourselves. But I love it because I was washed in Jesus' blood. Boy, I don't deserve that. But God the Father, God Himself, sent His Son... And Jesus washed me in His blood, an undeserving sinner. 
an undeserving, an undeserving young man that's a sinner that deserves to spend eternity in hell. But I get to be washed this morning in the blood of Christ. Boy, I get excited about that kind of stuff. Amen. Number two, Matthew 27, 4. I could be stuck on that all day. We could have one whole message, but we got to move on. Matthew 27, verse number 4. Matthew 27, verse number 4. It says, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. This is Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. And he admitted that he knew who Jesus was because, look, he says, I betrayed innocent blood. Boy, Jesus was innocent. In other words, Jesus was pure. Jesus was not guilty of all that they tried to accuse him of. Jesus was framed. He was innocent. Boy, it's innocent blood. Even Judas realized that it was an innocent man. All these other religions try to say that Jesus is not God. And even Judas betrayed him, burning in hell. And he's going to spend eternity in hell. But he knew I betrayed innocent blood. Boy, it's innocent blood. The blood of Christ is pure. It's clean. It's holy, undefiled. Amen. Number three, Matthew 27, 24. It says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made... He took water and, wanted, and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Jesus was just. His blood was just. Amen. His blood was just. It means having no fault, perfect in every way, no taint of sin. Innocent mean, meant he wasn't guilty. Innocent meant that he was framed and tried to be called something else than what he really was, the Son of God. But he's also just. He's, he has no fault. He's perfect in every way. He's the Savior of the world. Boy, I love it. Amen. We keep going, though. We've got to keep going. There's more to it. Hebrews 9, 12. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 12. The Bible says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Boy, it's eternal blood. Amen. That blood is going to live from the dawn of, from, from when Jesus shed it all the way till eternity goes on and on and on. It's eternal blood. The Bible says here that it's, it's by His blood that He entered into the holy place that's in heaven, sprinkled it on the mercy seat, and that blood for you is going to cry forgiven forever. Amen. Boy, what a blessing. Amen. Eternal blood. You realize your blood is going to dissipate and die and, and, and going to be gone. Amen. But the blood of Christ for you is going to be on the mercy seat for eternity. That's why we have eternal salvation. That's why we believe in eternal security. Because the blood is going to be around for eternity. Amen. What a blessing. It's eternal blood. Notice, there's not going to be a baptistry in heaven. Notice, there won't be a church building in heaven. Notice, you're going to be perfect in heaven. You know why? Because none of these things bring eternal redemption. But what's going to be in heaven is the blood that brought you eternal redemption. That's why that's there. Amen. All of these things are here for a while. But Jesus' blood is for eternity. Amen. So that's why you can know. Look, as I said, Hebrews 9 and 12, it says, having obtained eternal redemption. You can't lose it. Amen. Salvation's a one and done deal. Amen. You put your faith and trust in Christ. It's eternal redemption. Boy, I can't stop there. We could preach a whole other message on that point right there. Let's keep moving. 1 Peter 1.19, the last thing about the blood. 1 Peter 1.19, it says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, in the Hebrew days, they had the lambs. And they had to have a lamb to sacrifice on that altar to represent Christ. That lamb had to be perfect in that it had no blemish and had no spot. Could not be sick, could not be lame, could not have a disease spot on nothing. It had to be as perfect as can be. And then that lamb was laid on that altar and it represented Jesus to come. But that lamb was looked at as precious. They kept that lamb from getting hurt. They kept that lamb from the sick. They kept that lamb from, from anything that could happen to it because they needed that lamb 
to represent Christ. It was precious. You know, Jesus' blood was precious. It is precious blood. How often do we not realize how precious Christ's blood is? It's a different thought. It's, it's not just eternal. It's not just required for salvation. It's not just innocent. It's not just just. But to us that are saved, boy, it's precious because it brings salvation. You ever had something that your parents maybe handed down to you? And you keep, you know, and to others, they look at it and go, what do you have that for? And you say, well, it's sentimental. It belonged to somebody else, and they gave it to me, and I love them. It's for sentimental reasons. Well, you know, Jesus' is, blood ought to be the same way. Jesus shed His blood, and then gives it to us, washes us in His blood. He gave you what you did not deserve. Boy, that ought to be precious. You ought to get up and thank God every day for the blood that Jesus shed. That's why we have communion. We take time to say thank you to God for the blood, the precious blood of Christ. How dare we take that blood, the Bible says, and we walk over it. People are going to walk over the precious blood of Christ right into hell. But they'll have to walk over the blood because Jesus shed it. But even Christians, we get to where we're saved. We're born again. We have the precious blood. But then we just put Jesus on a back burner. Say, well, I'll get to you later, Jesus. I've got, to, I got stuff I've got to do. Boy, that blood is precious. That's why it's so important, amen. It's a precious blood. How I love the blood of Christ. Boy, you ought to take time every day. I can't stress that enough. You ought to every day take time to thank God for that blood. You're going to spend eternity in heaven because of Jesus today. Amen. Thank Jesus for that blood. Now, those were the descriptions of the blood of Christ. We're going to talk about what the blood can do, and then we'll be done. What the blood of Jesus can do. Amen. There's more to it than what we think. But I love this verse. I wanted to give you this verse real quick. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. I was doing all this Bible study. What time is it? Good, we got time. Amen. We're going to go here real quick. Hebrews chapter 1. I love studying the Bible, and I was doing a study on the blood of Christ and so many things that are there, but I love this verse. I wanted to give it to you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. You say, Pastor, you're crazy. I know, my wife tells me, but it's all right. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. You ready? It says, Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Boy, I love those words right there, by himself. <laughs> Jesus, by himself, he didn't need help, amen, to take care of your sins. He didn't need help from anybody else. He didn't need the baptis baptism. He didn't need the church. He didn't need some earthly man to help him pay for your sin. Jesus did it all by himself, amen. Boy, that, was, that got me going. I thought, wow, amen, that's a great verse. By himself purged our sins. All of them, every one of them, they're all gone, amen. When I got saved, got born again, praise God, everyone from the past all the way to the future, Richard Haley's born again, clean, because Jesus by himself. Boy, that ought to get you think. You ought to think about that and just be like, wow. That's cool. <laughs> amen. I just like that kind of stuff. Amen. You see those verses, the little words. Amen. This is why the Bible talks about every jot and every tittle is important. Amen. That's why you don't add to or take away from the Word of God because then you lose these words that mean so much that change doctrine. Amen. Jesus by Himself purged our sins. And when He was done, He sat down. You know why? He was done. He came, did what He had to do. Then He went to the right hand of the Father said, All right. My work's done. Sat down. <laughs> Amen. Jesus sat down because he was finished. It was done. You don't need anything else today. You don't need to trust anything else. You don't have to doubt and worry. Is Jesus going to be able to take me to heaven? No, he sat down. It's finished. Jesus is standing up, sitting up in heaven, wondering, looking at a bunch of Christians going, what do you doubt for? What are you worried about? I'm finished. I did it all. You trusted me. It's done. Move on. Get, get going. Amen. Do something for God. Tell somebody else. Boy, I loved that. Anyway, we could preach a whole other sermon on that one. Here we go. Number one, what the blood of Christ does. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. 
verse number 9. Number one, it justifies. Romans chapter 5, verse number 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. You can get an idea like this. Justified in God's eyes, it's just as if you'd never sinned. Justified. Justified never sinned. When God looks at you, you're justified by the blood. When He looks at you, it's like you never did anything wrong. It's like, you know, uh, some of us have tickets on our record. <clears throat> Not me, amen. I'm the best driver in the... Uh, never mind. But, <laughs> Lord forgive me. <laughs> now, but you know, some of us have a clean record. I don't know who, but now my mother-in-law does. <clears throat> she is... I won't tell you her age, but... Uh, you can't do that, I forgot. But she, uh, she's she been driving a long time, and she her record is perfect. She's never had a ticket once in her life. I thought, wow. You know, the, the, the police pull up, and one time she almost got a ticket. It was so funny, and she was bawling. Ah, she's like, and the guy come up to the window. Yeah, it's kind of. Ma'am, you okay? She's like, I've never, never had a ticket, you know, and he, didn't, he just gave her a warning, let her go. And uh, I was like, oh, just give her one. Come on, come on, just give her one. You know, Miss Perfect. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, but, you know, when they look at her record, it's clean. You know, when you go into Texas, they have this thing you can do. Uh, when, uh, uh, what is that, brother? You can get your tickets taken off of in Texas. Huh? Right, but you do that thing. Whatever course... Yeah, defensive driving, you take that, and then what they'll do is they'll take your ticket and wipe it off. I was like, man, we need that in Kansas. And, uh, but in Texas, you can do that. So what you do is you get a ticket, you go down, take a defensive driving course, and uh, they'll take that ticket, wipe it off. You can only do it like once, though, but they'll do it, wipe it off, and you have a clean record. Amen. The Bible says Jesus was the same way. You sin. You deserve it. You deserve to go to hell. You deserve to spend eternity and pay for the sin that you've done against God Almighty. But the Bible says that Jesus came and wiped the record clean. He looks at your, he looks at your record and says, well, they don't, they don't have any sin. You get to stand before God and God gets to say, well done, that good and faithful servant, entering into the joy, and you get to walk right into heaven. Why? Because God looks at you and the record swiped clean. Amen. That's what justification is. Amen. Boy, I love that. And again, a whole other sermon. Keep going. Hebrews 13, verse or, uh, no, Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. See, this is what y'all do. Y'all to go this week, and while you're out around this week, look at somebody and say, Hey, guess what? I'm justified. Watch what they do. What? <laughs> and say, Hey, boy, I'm thankful for the blood of Christ. Watch what people do. Whoa. But you know what? If you got excited about it, somebody else might want to get saved. So, hey, come on. Ephesians 1, verse 7. You ready? In whom we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Christ's blood redeems. It purchases back. It ransoms. It liberates. It rescues from captivity or bondage. It delivers us. We were in bondage to sin. You were a sinner. You were, you were, in, you were in bondage to sin. Sin had you a slave and was going to lead you right to hell. But Jesus' blood, it bought you back. Amen. Why did it buy us back? Because we at one time, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they belonged to God. God had made them, but when they sinned, they now became a slave to sin and now had to pay the punishment. But Jesus came and paid for sin 2,000 years ago, and now we've been redeemed. We've been bought back. Amen. Well, I love that. There's a story of a little boy that he made his own boat. He carved this boat and he made it to where it can float out of wood and made the mast and just took all this time and just really worked at this boat. And he took it out to the lake and he put the boat on the water and he would watch it go and he would let it go out so far and then he would wait out and get it and bring it back. And he just loved this boat. And he kept going and going and doing this every day for this little boat that he had made. He loved it and it was his first thing he'd ever made. Finally, he had the boat, but he let it go out a little too far. And he thought, oh, I need to go get it. And then he said, no, that's neat. Look how far it goes. Finally, he let it go too far, and he tried to wait out, but he couldn't reach it, and his boat began to drift away, and he couldn't get his boat. Came home crying, lost his boat. He thought, it's gone. I can't replace that, my first boat. He had put his initials in it and everything. He thought, it's gone. Weeks, months passed. He's walking down the, the road, looks in a little toy store. And there's his boat. He thought, my boat. 
He walked in there and said, sir, sir, can I see that boat? And he said, sure. The man got it, put it up there. And the boy looked, and on the bottom of it, sure enough, had his initials. He said, sir, this is my boat. This is my boat. I made this boat. And the man said, well, son, I'm sorry. I, I found this boat, and it you can buy it, but I, I, I can't give it to you. And he said, but, sir, I made this. You don't understand. This is mine. And he said, well, I'm sorry. I, it's mine now, but you can buy it. And the little boy went home just think and determined. He said, you know what? I'm going to buy that boat. He worked, and he worked. Weeks passed. Months passed. He worked as hard as he could. He saved up all the money that he could. He did everything that he could, and he would go by and tell that man, don't sell that boat. Don't sell that boat. That's mine. I want it. And he kept working and working and doing and as hard as he could, this little boy, and he, would, and he just worked his heart out. Finally, the day came. He got to go back to that store, and he put that money down on the table, slapped it down. He said, now give me my boat. That man walked over there and said, here you go, son. It's yours. You know, like that, we were that boat. We drifted away from God. We're, we've sinned. Amen. Adam and Eve sinned that long ago. And now we're sinners to this very day. We're, and you know what? But Jesus walked by and he saw us in the window. And he said, you know what? That's mine. That's mine. I want it back. And Jesus paid for your sin so you could be redeemed, the Bible says. That's what the blood of Christ can do for you. It can redeem you. It can buy you back. You can become his again. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. If you're not saved this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, boy, you need to get redeemed. Amen. Now let's keep going. We've got to hurry. Ephesians chapter, uh, or, uh, Hebrews 13 verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered without the gate. You see, the blood of Christ also sanctifies us. It sets us apart. When you got saved, Jesus washed you in His blood. Now you're sanctified. You're no longer with everyone else. You're set apart. You're His. When Jesus comes back, splits that cloud, uh, splits the eastern sky wide open, amen, and the trump sounds, and He says, Come up hither. All those that are set apart, that are sanctified, will get to go. Those that are not washed in the blood, those that are not set apart by the blood of Jesus will not get to go to heaven. That's what the Bible talks about. That's what sanctification is. Jesus sanctified us. You can't be sanctified or set apart for that day if, if you're trusting in the church. You can't be sanctified or set apart for that day if you're trusting in your works or trusting in your dad or whatever the case may be. Sanctification comes through the blood of Christ. And when Jesus looks down one day and he says, come up hither, if he sees the blood, then you've been set apart and you get to spend eternity in heaven. Boy, that'll be great, amen. You're set apart. You no longer have to live like the world. You no longer have to be of the world, the Bible says, because you're not of the world. You're a stranger in a foreign land. You're just wandering here for a while. But boy, you get to go to heaven, amen, one day. And we got to keep going. <laughs> uh, Revelations 1.5. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5. What else does the blood do? It washes. Look, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Boy, I love that. Amen. It's kind of like this. Here's another illustration. And uh, I was out working one day. And uh, I come out, and I was out here fixing up some things for my wife. I planted her some nice flowers and, you know, all the good things us good husbands do for our wives. You know, we do the we flowers and the mulch, and I was working hard. Boy, I was working hard. I was sweating, amen. I, I sweat. I just have this, I just sweat like crazy. And I'm just out there sweating, getting a drink of water, have to stay hydrated. I come back in to give my wife a kiss. I said, honey, look at that. looks pretty good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Ah! And she said, don't you kiss me, you nasty. And uh, I was like, what? I'm your husband. She's like, I know, but that's nasty. She's like, you're sweaty. Don't touch me. Don't kiss me. So what I do is I run around and give her a hug, you know. Oh, and she's like, ah. You know what she makes me do first? I have to go take a shower. I got to wash all that filth off of me. And then she says, now you can give, give me a kiss. I thought, okay, Amen. <laughs> You know, when you, go, you try to go to God, God looks at you and sees all the filth of sin as a sinner, and He says, don't come near me. Don't try to pray. 
Don't try to get a hold of me. Don't come near me. But when you get saved, amen, Jesus washes you in his blood and Jesus says, come here, buddy. Jesus with open arms says, what, what do you need? What's going on? Let me talk to you. Amen. Boy, what a blessing. When you're saved, you're born again. Jesus puts you in his blood. He washes the filth of sin away and he washes us in his own blood. Notice he doesn't wash you anything else. And just the blood. Because that's all it takes. Amen. The blood of Christ. He washes you in the blood. And now God with open arms can say, come to me. Boy, what a blessing. Amen. Sin can be washed away. You can have that. Nothing else will work. That's why when we give the gospel, we tell them, if you'll just trust Jesus right now, call upon Him and ask Him to save you, you can be born again. Nothing else is needed. And even the faith of a child, God says, even a child can say, Jesus, I want to be washed from my sin. I want to go to heaven. Now, that's not saying you'll be perfect. It's not saying that it'll wash away sin and you'll never be a sinner. But what it's saying is, is that blood is paid for. Gone. Even the sin you will do. Jesus continually, continually washes. It's eternal blood. It just continues to wash that sin. So for eternity, you're saved. You're born again. Some people get the false idea that when I get saved, now I have to be perfect. I've had even people tell me, they say, well, I got saved, but I, I still sin. And I tell them, I say, it's all right. You're a sinner. That's what you're going to do till the day you die. The point of salvation is that you're saved from that punishment of sin. You'll not be saved from this old flesh until the day that you die or Jesus comes back, but you'll be saved from that punishment for eternity. Boy, I love that. And they can try to trust everything else. Go ahead, every other religion in, in Wichita, Kansas, and try to trust everything else. But I'll take the blood, amen. Colossians 1.20, hurry, hurry. Boy, there's so much good stuff about the blood. Colossians 1.20. The blood of Christ makes peace. Look here, it says, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. The blood of Christ, what it does is when you get saved, it makes peace between you and God. Because God says when you're lost, there's wrath. When you're lost, when you're unsaved, when you don't have Christ, God says the wrath of God dwells upon you. Why? Because of sin. When you're not saved, you constantly live. That's why people say, well, I never hear from God. Well, that's because you're not saved. God's wrath dwells on you because of that sin. God hates sin. But when you get saved, the blood of Christ washes you from sin. It puts a peace between you and God that now you can come to the Father. That's why now, when, that's why if you want, if, when people get saved, now they have an opportunity to pray. Now they have an opportunity to watch God work. I've had people tell me, say, well, I try to pray and God never answers. But that, that's because you've not made peace with God. You've got to make that peace through the blood of Christ. Nothing else can make peace with the Father. Nothing else that you do can God, have, can God be satisfied with. It takes the blood of Christ. Keep you moving. Hebrews 9, 14. What else does it do? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You didn't know this, did you? The blood of Christ purges you. In other words, it doesn't just stop at salvation. It continues to work in you as a Christian till the day you die. Look there, it purges from dead works to serve a living God. The blood of Christ gives you the opportunity now to do the will of God. You now, when you're saved, you're born again, you now have an opportunity to serve God. When you got saved, it puts you in God's army. You got saved, now time to serve God. You're dead. You can be dead to these works. Now, this is, this is also a decision for the Christian. Because the, Bible, the blood of Christ will purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It will give you that opportunity, but doesn't mean that every Christian takes it. There's a lot of Christians that are still backslidden as the devil. You know why? They've not allowed their conscience to be purged. God wants to purge you. God's blood allows you to be able to serve God. God wants you to do more for Him but you've got to let the blood of Christ do its work. 
You've got, you got saved. Just like you had to make a decision to get saved, you've got to make a decision to let God purge your conscience. And stop serving the dead works. Stop doing things that are dead. You over here beating around in the cemetery with all the dead bones. The world is a bunch of dead bones. The world is just full of dead things. It doesn't amount to anything. doesn't profit for eternity. And Christians are over here wallowing in the mud. But God says He wants you to serve Him. Boy, that's a blessing. We can serve God. We can be purged from dead works. And you can serve a living God. You don't have to serve the devil. You've been given victory. You can come and serve a living God. Boy, what a blessing that it is. It purges you. So that means that God is trying to make you different. That's where when you come and you hear the pastor preach and you hear the Word of God, the Holy Spirit convicts you and tells you where you need to get right, where you need to do more, where you need to do this. You feel the Holy Spirit. That's the blood of Christ allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you. Answer that call. Don't push God away. Well, this is what I think. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care how he's, what, what the Bible says. I want to do this. That's how most Christians are. Don't do that. Let the blood of Christ purge you. Let it purge you from being in dead works to serving a living God. You know what's de- How do you know what dead works is? When, it in- when it's involved in the world. The world doesn't like to go to church. They go to a football game on Sunday. That's dead works. The world doesn't like to have to go to church Sunday night. They want to go to the movies. That's dead works. The world doesn't like to have to go down to the, to the, ho- to the church house and go soul winning. They want to do everything else. You know what that is? That's dead works. Amen. Serve a living God. Now, there are times when things happen and God puts and schedules are conflict. Yes. But when you put anything as a priority over God, it's dead works. Because it doesn't amount to anything. It won't, bring, it won't profit you as a Christian. You're trying to lay up treasures in heaven, not treasures on the earth. Amen. Dead works. Let's get out of this dead works mentality. We get, as Christians, we've got to get out of this dead works thing. All these, all these movies and all this music and all this stuff that the world is involved in and Christians, we're, getting, we're over here kicking around in the cemetery. It's dead works. Boy, get out tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Here we go. All right. We've got to keep going. Woo. Caffeine, I tell you, it'll do it to you. Now, if, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.16. 1 Corinthians 10.16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? When we take the Lord's Supper, it's a, we, we call it communion. Why? Because when you got saved, the blood of Christ gives you communion. In other words, it gives you fellowship. You're na- you are now able through the blood to walk over to Jesus and get on your knees and ask a friend for help. I had a friend, uh, my brother-in-law this last week, he hydroplaned and, and did some things to his truck because of the weather, and it was just a mess. I had a friend in Longview that I've been friends with now for uh, a, a few years that I made, an, and I was able to give him a call, and I said, hey, can you, can you do me a favor, my brother-in-law, this and this, and he was able to help and go do some things, and he's still trying to help him out. We have communion. We have fellowship. And that's a blessing to have a friend. You know what? Jesus is that way for you. When you got saved, you can now go and say, Jesus, I need some help. How do you get a hold of God? You pray. You can call on Jesus. Say, Jesus, I can't make the bills, but I tithe. I need help. That's what I do for the church. Say, Jesus, we got bills. This is your church, not mine. And God takes care of it. You're given communion with God. You can now fellowship. You can read your Bible. You can pray and talk to God and have a sweet fellowship that only comes through the blood of Christ. You cannot have fellowship with Jesus until you've been washed in that blood. So, again, let's keep moving. Ephesians 2.13. What else does the blood of Christ do? It says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The blood of, the blood of Christ draws you nigh to God, the Bible says. In other words, you had to stay away from God as far as possible because of sin, but because of the blood of Christ, you now can yoke up with Jesus. You can be arm in arm with God. It draws you nigh. It brings you to God. You don't have, that's the funny thing is, you don't have to draw closer to God to be saved. 
Some people say, well, if you're not doing things and, and you're not allowed, and you, all of these things and you're not working for God, then you just didn't really get saved. You don't have to get close to God. The Bible says the blood of Christ draws you to Him. Amen? It draws you nigh. What a blessing. Let's keep moving. Revelations 12, 11. Last thing. We'll be done. You said, yay. Revelations 12, 11. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. The last thing the blood of Christ does is it gives you victory. The blood of Christ gives you victory. When you got saved, you are now able to overcome. Who can you overcome? The devil. They overcame him, the Bible says, by the blood of the Lamb. You can overcome the devil. There's nothing that holds you in this life that God can't give you the victory over. A lot of people say, well, I'm just, I, I just can't seem to get over it. Not an excuse. Because the blood of Christ gave you the victory. You can overcome. You've just got to let the blood purge you. See, we, just, we don't like this purging thing. We don't like to God to come over and clip things off. Well, God, I don't want to get rid of that. Leave that on. God says it's dead. You ever had plants? You had to prune plants? What do you do? You take off all the dead stuff. Why? Because you want it to grow. If you've got all this dead stuff, it can't grow. Causes diseases, causes all that stuff. Well, we as Christians, we sit over here and we have this dead stuff growing. And we like it. God says, now nah, you got to get that off of there. you got to get that off of there. And God will give you the victory. Boy, you can have victory today. Nothing that you face, God can't help you with. Boy, the blood of Christ can do all of these things. But you have to be willing to put your faith in His blood. Anybody like that this morning? Maybe you'd say, Pastor, you were preaching. I've never put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. And I know I'm not. Well, you can have all of these promises from God's Word. And you know what the blessing is? You don't got to come take a four-week class. You just got to come down to an old-fashioned altar and put your faith and trust in Jesus and ask Him to save you and ask Him to give it to you. God says it's a gift. It's free. Amen. But now if you're saved this morning, boy, you ought to be excited about it. Boy, you ought to be happy you got the blood of Christ. But not only be happy about it, but do something with it. Serve a living God. Boy, we begin to question. Well, I don't know if I should. Ah, don't question. Don't ask questions. Let God have it, amen. Just get in, in line and serve God, amen. Boy, we as Christians, we hesitate too much. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Nah, amen. Just trust God. Trust His Word. Amen. I promise you everything we've taught, it's been Bible-based. Just trust God. Get in there. Serve a living God. And you'll find God can do a work. Amen. Funny how that, you know, we try to, we try to uh, do God's work. Like I said the other day, we try to do it God's way. And then we don't, we don't understand why we don't have God's blessings. God says, because you're kicking around in the dirt. Kick around in the dead stuff. Serve a living God. Amen. Boy, I could get going again, but we gotta, we got to be done. Amen? But let me encourage you. Be happy about being saved. Boy, when you go out, wear a smile. Go, go, to, the, go to McDonald's through the drive-thru. Hand that lady a track or the man a track. Say, hey, are you washing the blood? What? <laughs> Watch what people do. Boy, I love it. I do that kind of stuff. I walk up to people, hand them a track, jump over the wall, <laughs> tell people, say, hey, you know, Jesus can do something. And you know why? This world is serving dead works. But it's because they're not born again. They're not saved. I was talking to my barb, uh, not my barber, but I got my hair cut in Beeville because I was looking like a hippie. Man, let me tell you, I had to get my hair cut. And uh, I was beginning to look like a woman. I thought, oh, gracious. I got my hair cut and I was talking to the barber. And he said, you know, this is crazy. This world, America's going down the drain, rah, 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 doing all this stuff. And I know him because he, he's cut my, uh, uh, my in-law's hair for a long time. And I'm sitting here and I'm just kind of taking I said, you know what America's problem is? He's like, yeah. You know, because when you're a barber, uh, you know, or you go to a barbershop, you've got to talk about everything. You know, you just, you, just you, know, you know, that's how you just do the barbershop, you know. And uh, so I said, you know what America's problem is? Yeah, what? I said, just ain't nobody saved. What? I said, yeah. I said, ain't nobody saved. I said, God can give the victory to America. We can have revival. I said, but ain't nobody putting their trust in Christ anymore. Everybody wants to do it their way. He got off that subject real quick. <laughs> but you know why? That's the answer. We want to muddle around with God. We don't want to have to do what God says. 
And Christians are the same way. We're in church. We hear the Word of God preached. And we still question God. Boy, you know why we don't have revival in America's churches? Because what we held up long ago, we dropped. And we let it go. What the America's fundamental independent Baptist churches held long ago, the standard we'd held high, and we waved it for the world to see, we've dropped it. I still have time. Don't worry. I still have a few more minutes. We've dropped it. We've dropped the blood. We've dropped salvation. We've dropped the churches. We've dropped the standards. You know, and the world wonders, what's going on? Why are we in havoc? Because the churches stopped waving the standard high. Now we're around with them. We're kicking, the de we're kicking with the world. See, this is what happens. The church doesn't follow the world. The world will follow the church. When the church goes liberal, the world goes liberal. A lot of people try to say, well, what it is is the world goes that way and the church draws closer to it. And that's true. But this is what the problem is. The church, when the churches are not strong, the world declines. That's why God says at the end times there'll be, there'll be, uh, th there'll be people uh, that uh, they, uh, they heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears, all of those things. You know what that is? That's the church. The church declines. We don't want to hear the old time hard messages anymore. We don't want to hear about standards. We don't want to hear about everything else. And you wonder why the world's a mess. We've stopped doing it God's way and getting God's blessing. We've dropped it. We don't no longer require all of these things and we don't hold up the word of God anymore and say this is how God wants it done. And then we wonder why the blessings of God don't fall. You know why? We're dropping it. We're letting the world determine how we function. God says, God forbid. He says, I made the world. I made the government. I made all that. You do what I tell you to do. Amen. Boy, we as Christians need to get some grit. That's what we need. We need grit. Now, I'm not talking about John Wayne. John Wayne didn't have grit. If he had grit, he'd have been in church instead of making movies. Amen! John Wayne wouldn't have been over there shooting him up on a TV show, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes. He'd have been in church, bless God. He's leading people astray, making them think, beer's cool, because I'm John Wayne. And then we look down at the pastor when he gets up and he preaches and says, young people, stay away. Listen to the word of God. It'll hurt you. And we look down and say, how dare he? But we'll watch John Wayne. Wow, he's cool. We'll put him on the billboards along the highways. Don't, like mu don't much like quitters, son. That's what I saw driving down through Oklahoma. But you know what? I thought, what are you talking about? He quit on God. America's quit on God. Boy, we need grit in America. We need grit in our churches that'll say, doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to follow God's word. I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to trust God by faith. Amen. Now we close. But trust God. Amen. Put your faith in His blood. If you're not saved this morning, boy, you just need to get saved. Boy, you just need to hang it all and say, look, who cares what people think? Who cares what the world thinks? Who cares what my family thinks? Who cares what everybody else thinks? I want to go and spend eternity in heaven. I want all that. And if you're saved this morning, you need to get some grit about you that says, you know what, if the Bible says it, we believe it. No more walking around questioning and letting the world tell us what to do. We serve a living God within the confines of the Word of God. Amen. Boy, America could have revival. Could have revival all over. Wichita can have the greatest revival ever seen if we would just get back to God's word. Amen. I believe it. And we're going to, do the best. We're going to give it the best shot we can. Amen. We're going, to make, we're going to make a lot of people mad. Churches in town are going to think, what's that crazy church down there on Web Road doing? I'll tell you what we're doing. We're putting Jesus high. Amen. All right. We're done. Amen. I said that twice now. Three times, actually. Anybody keeping count? No. Okay. Good. That means you were listening. Whew. No. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I beg that you'd help us this morning. Lord, how I love to get to preach. And Lord, how the blood of Christ does so much for the believer. Holy Spirit, I pray that the message was a blessing. Holy Spirit, if it was, uh, 
if it touched anybody's heart at all, then, Lord, I'm so thankful. God, I pray that it was. Lord, I'm thankful that, Jesus, you've saved me by your blood. That many years ago, when I put my faith and trust in you, Jesus, as a young boy, and I asked you, Jesus, and I begged you to save me because I didn't want to go to hell. If anybody here is not saved, Lord Jesus, may they understand and realize this morning that they too can be saved, that Jesus will wash them in his blood as well. They just need to come and put their faith and trust in Jesus and trust him as their Savior. I pray that you give them the courage to do that. Lord, if anybody here this morning, and maybe they're saved, but God, they know that they need to do more to serve you. They need to be purged from these dead works, God, and serve a living God. Then I pray that they'd come forward and make a decision, God, to do that. That they'd get things right with you, Lord, and allow you to use them and serve a living God. I pray that you'd help us to do that as a church. Lord, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, so much. Thank you, Jesus, so much for the blood that you shed. How I know that I'm not thankful enough. I need to get up every day and throughout the day. Take time to thank you for the blood, Jesus, that you shed. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us, dying for us. May, we, may you bless the invitation time. Heads bowed, nice closed. The pianist is going to play. We all